Welcome to the last lecture in our spring series, Oceans Alive. And tonight we have a real treat in Dick Norris, associate scientist in the geology and geophysics department. We'll be presenting some of his recent findings on geological evidence of the impact event that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. Dick was on a recent cruise uh, funded by the Ocean Drilling Program and came across some very exciting geological evidence which he'll share with you this evening. So without further ado, Dick. Well, thank you all for turning up. And what I'm going to talk about today um, is the events that surrounded the extinction of the dinosaurs and something on the order of 40 to 70 percent of all other species that then existed on the planet about 65 million years ago. And so this was one of the biggest mass extinctions in the last 600 million years. And it has long been very enigmatic as to actually what caused it. You probably all heard theories about, uh, well, the mammals eating the dinosaur eggs or uh, supernovae someplace that cause irradiation to happen all over the planet and kill off the dinosaurs and so forth. There's been many, many theories over the years about the nature of this extinction event. And of course, it's particularly fascinating because it involves the extinction of this extremely large and very successful group of organisms that had lived on the planet for almost 200 million years and then just they got snuffed out, just bang, like that. And they, of course, they were very, not only a diverse group of organisms, but extremely interesting because of their tremendous size, at least for some of the species involved. So if we could have, let's see, the slides. Um, so anyway, here we have a triceratops uh, skull from the uh, uh, late Cretaceous, uh, this period of time about 65 million years ago. Uh, in this case, it's from Montana. And these were not the only group of organisms to disappear, okay, during this mass extinction event 65 million years ago. Um, there were little things that also disappeared. Here we have uh, a needle, and there perched on the end of it is a little microscopic fossil uh, that occurred in tremendous abundance in the oceans, and these things also suffered, in many cases, very extensive extinction. Uh, there are some more bizarre groups of organisms, such as the ammonites. These are relatives of the uh, chambered nautilus that patrols the oceans today. And uh, the basic element, okay, to keep in mind, <coughs> is that fundamentally the late Cretaceous world was populated by very large and successful organisms on the whole. And so I use this as kind of a, you'll have to pardon me, okay, this is a, a rather poor analogy, but basically the idea is that if, if this is sort of what the dinosaurs were like, big successful organisms that were sort of tromping on their, uh, their uh, various competitors, then in the aftermath of this extinction, we're left with, <laughs> okay, with this. Uh, basically life was sort of reverted to the simplest, the sort of most uh, uh, utilitarian of, uh, of designs in the aftermath of the extinction. And indeed, as you'll see in some of my later slides, um, it seems as though many groups of organisms went from being these very large kinds of critters like the dinosaurs to being very small things in the aftermath of the extinction. So there's both a reduction in the kind of ecological complexity of life on the planet and the numbers of species and things like that to a much sort of simpler, relatively lower diversity group of organisms in the aftermath of this extinction. All right, now one of the theories that has uh, held sway for a long time is that large volcanic eruptions or other kinds of uh, changes in earth processes were what ultimately caused climatic change and therefore caused the extinction of these diverse group of organisms in the oceans and also on land. And in contrast to this, back about uh, 1980 or so, uh, Walter Alvarez from the University of California at Berkeley suggested that maybe a big impact event of some sort of extraterrestrial object uh, might have caused so much environmental chaos that that could have been the trigger for essentially a global calamity, a global extinction. And as it happens, over the years, the evidence has actually accumulated in favor of Alvarez's hypothesis. And so here we have a sort of a boring looking set of, uh, of clay stones out in Montana. This is a thin coal bed right here. 
And this white layer uh, represents a material that apparently was derived from a big impact event. And some of the evidence for that is shown here. This is that, uh, just sort of diagrammatically, here's that coal bed. These are Cretaceous age sediments below that contain uh, dinosaur fossils and other kinds of, of evidence of abundant, large, diverse life on the uh, surface of the planet. And then above the coal bed, we have so-called tertiary deposits that accumulate during the time when the mammals and other groups of organisms evolved after this mass extinction. Uh, now, interestingly, associated with this uh, little clay bed right in here, right below the coal, is a tremendous increase in the abundance of fern spores, okay, the reproductive uh, cells of ferns. And as you know, uh, if you clear the forest someplace, one of the first things to grow back uh, after some sort of um, you know, fire is burned through or something like that it, are ferns. They tend to be kind of a disaster species that can take over in the aftermath of, of clearing away the rest of the vegetation. And very interestingly, this uh, increase in the abundance of ferns is associated with a tremendous increase in the abundance of a metal called iridium. And iridium is a platinum group metal, so it's, it's very sort of a precious metal in a sense because it's very rare on the surface of the earth. But it happens to be very common within meteorites, asteroids, uh, things like that. And uh, so when we find a great deal of iridium in surface uh, sediments, it is suggestive anyway that it was all introduced in more or less one big gobbet, okay, like a big meteorite impact of some sort. So here we have evidence for a meteorite impact, and that happens to coincide with evidence for some major disaster uh, befalling the surface of the planet here in Montana. All right, now as it happens, if we look at a reconstruction of what the world was like 65 million years ago, you can see the continents are not quite in their present positions, and we look at the, uh, the sort of a distribution of places around the world where we find increases in the abundance of iridium, this meteoric signature, basically it's all over the world, all right? There's lots and lots of evidence from this late so-called Cretaceous tertiary time or KT boundary uh, 65 million years ago for, the, um, for a meteorite impact event that has distributed iridium globally. All right, now typically in the deep ocean, this is what you find. This is a deep ocean core from off of South Africa. This is a centimeter scale over here. And uh, believe it or not, that's the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. It's pretty undistinguished. You know, if you didn't really know what to look for, it, you'd probably pass it over. And, uh, and on the whole, what we find is that the sediments have accumulated relatively slowly in the deep ocean. Uh, maybe a centimeter, you know, that much every thousand years or so. And as a consequence, because there's burrowing organisms down there churning the sediment up, the record of any sort of event or instant in time tends to get smeared over an interval maybe that thick or so. Okay? And so we lose any ability to resolve kind of day to day or month to month or, or even thousand year to thousand year kind of events uh, in the deep sea. Now what we did, and what, why, the reason why I'm sitting up here talking to you, is that we looked at evidence from a feature called Blake Plateau out here uh, off of Florida, and we drilled through a layer of material that was deposited by this big impact event, and I'll try to demonstrate that in just a moment, uh, and uh, we found that we could actually get a much better, more sort of highly resolved record of the events surrounding this impact event than we've been able to get previously from the deep ocean. Now as it happens, okay, we were drilling out here, but right over here on the Gulf of Mexico, buried in the subsurface of the northern Yucatan Peninsula, is a big crater. And that crater, which is about 180 kilometers across, okay, here to here, um, and this is seen in, in a sort of a geophysical log where you're kind of imaging what is underneath the surface of the, of the Yucatan Peninsula. You can't actually observe this kind of stuff on the surface. You have to use uh, special techniques to observe it. But in any case, this is a big impact structure. And it's been known since the 1960s or so that there's an impact structure there. The Mexicans drilled it looking for oil because often oil is associated with impact uh, structures. And uh, they didn't find any oil and they forgot about it. And it wasn't until 1989 that scientists looking for evidence of, of uh, impact event at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary 
went back and essentially rediscovered this particular feature and then dated rocks from this area and found out that they dated exactly, okay, to 65 million years ago, plus or minus about 100,000 years. Now, 100,000 years, okay, well, I'm a geologist and I talk broadly about these huge numbers. 65 million years is something I can't really even conceive of how long that is. But basically, 65 million years plus or minus 100,000 is as good as we can do, pretty much, in terms of dating events of this age. And so this gives us a pretty good idea that this, is, this particular feature formed essentially at the same time, plus or minus 100,000 years, with the extinction of the dinosaurs. All right. So the key point is that, that, is that, that plus or minus 100,000 years, was this particular impact event actually synchronous with the extinction? And that's always been the hard part to determine. Okay, and very, various of the sites, in part because of this problem of burrowing organisms smearing out the record of the event. So what we did, uh, I and about 28 other scientists from all over the world, is we boarded the um, Ocean Drilling Program's flagship, the Joides Resolution, which is uh, regretfully uh, not uh, the Norwegian star back there, okay? Uh, this was in Bermuda, it was the height of the tourist season, we all wanted to go on board that ship instead of on the uh, somewhat rustier but serviceable vessel there. Uh, but in any case, we boarded this ship and we sailed off and we went and tried to recover records of the deep ocean sort of events around this big impact uh, event. Now before we did that, we had to assemble the scientific party. And one of them is this fellow here, you're seen from the back, is uh, Dick Kroon from the University of Edinburgh. He was my co-chief scientist, uh, along with myself, so we, we essentially split up the 24-hour work schedule into two different shifts. And uh, unfortunately, his bags went to um, Paris instead of coming to, uh, the Baham or coming to, um, to Barbados, and so here we are outfitting him with a new kit of clothes for the next six weeks at sea. All right, so here is the Joides Resolution. And uh, this is a drill ship that has a big derrick in the middle of it. There's a big motor up here that actually twists the drill pipe around so you can drill into the sea floor. Uh, on the aft end of the ship over here is about, uh, say, 10 kilometers or so, about six miles of drill pipe stacked back here. So we can drill in very deep water if need be. Uh, this big white structure in the middle are scientific laboratories for looking at the kinds of rocks that we recover from the deep ocean. And then in the front, right around in here, are the, uh, the crew quarters, the galley, uh, laundry facilities to keep you in reasonably clean clothes the whole time, and so forth. Now, in terms of the drilling technology, here you're looking up into the drilling derrick, okay? And there's that yellow thing up at the top, that kind of rectangular gizmo. That's actually the motor for, drilling the, uh, for turning the drill pipe. The drill pipe itself is hollow, and it's about say, uh, that big around. And what we do, instead of pulling the drill pipe out of the water every time we want to have a sample, we actually lower cables down the inside of the drill pipe and use tools to pull the samples up the inside of the drill pipe. And so once it's in place, we can leave it there until we're done drilling our hole. Uh, the working end of the drill pipe looks like this. Uh, this is sort of standard oil company technology. It doesn't look like it could drill through rock, but it actually does a pretty good job. And uh, these drill bits cost about seven, eight thousand bucks a piece, okay, sort of like a, a used car. Uh, and we went through quite a few of them on our cruise. This is uh, Marianne Holmes from the University of Nebraska. She's a sedimentologist on the cruise, and she's sitting next to one of our busted bits here, okay. And here you see the opening in the middle of the drill pipe that actually recovers the core, the pieces of rock and mud um, that we actually scientifically analyze. All right, so what we get out of this whole operation are cores, which are these plastic pipes, uh, pieces of PVC pipe that are full of mud. And those pipes get then cut lengthwise, so you get split sections like this. And so here's the, uh, in this case, rock uh, that is, has been cut in half so we can look at the layers, the geologic layers, and try to understand the nature of the ancient oceans. Okay, so as I said before, we were drilling up here, 
That's about 2,000 kilometers from the so-called Chuxalub impact structure, which I showed you a picture of earlier on. And uh, basically, it turned out this was a really great place to drill because when this impact occurred, it caused you know, death and devastation all around the Gulf of Mexico, totally wiping out most of the, the sort of the best geologic record of this particular event. But over here, we were protected by the big Florida platform. And so all the really catastrophic waves and so forth kicked up in the Gulf of Mexico uh, didn't reach out there to wreck the record that we were looking for. All right, so this is a core. This is one of the first cores that we drilled on our cruise. And what you're looking at are these split sections, okay, of, of drill pipe. The bottom of the core is there. This piece fits on to the bottom of that piece. The top of that fits on down here and so forth and so on until you get to the top of the core over there. All right? And as it happens, the mud down here is of Cretaceous age. It contains Cretaceous age fossils, characteristic of the time of the dinosaurs. And the mud up in here contains fossils that are characteristic of the succeeding time, the tertiary period in the aftermath of this mass extinction. And lo and behold, this layer right there is the key thing that we were hunting for that is the layer of material that apparently was blasted out of this big impact structure on the Yucatan Peninsula and lofted through the atmosphere okay, to land 2,000 kilometers away uh, here off of Florida. And here's a detailed view of that. Again, a centimeter scale over there. Um, this is basically looks like kind of greenish sand, and, which is basically what it is. It is sand that contains little pieces of chalk like the chalk on the chalkboard here. And uh, this greenish stuff is primarily little particles like that, okay? Little ball bearings. And like ball bearings, they probably formed by the sort of the condensation of, of hot vapor passing through, or little droplets of material passing through the atmosphere and becoming nice little round uh, sort of spherical particles by tumbling through the atmosphere. Uh, these are originally were glassy in composition, and we find similar kinds of particles, which are called tectites, uh, around modern impact structures, such as the uh, impact structure in uh, northern Arizona. This is Meteor Crater, which is about 15,000 years old or something like that uh, in northern Arizona. Okay, now the neat thing about this, if we look at the distribution of sizes of these little glassy particles, so-called tectites, okay, we find out that the biggest tectites, which are, you know, a little bit larger than a millimeter or so across, that's about like, you know, like that, they're pretty small, but anyway, the biggest ones form a nice sort of bullseye pattern right around the Yucatan Peninsula here where we know that impact structure occurs. And our samples from off of Blake Nose fit into that pattern pretty well, nice relatively large tectites there. If we go up into Alberta or Montana, or off into New Jersey, the tectites get smaller. And when we go into other places around the world, we have a different kind of sort of condensate from this uh, vapor plume produced by the impact called microcrystites, which have more or less a global distribution. So this is very good evidence, okay, that the material that we drilled here actually came from there, all right, because we have this nice sort of bullseye pattern. All right, now other kinds of things that occur within this tectite layer include pieces of limestone. And some of these pieces of limestone contain shallow water fossils that are characteristic of the kinds of things we'd expect from the Yucatan platform in northern Mexico. Uh, at the time of the impact, the Yucatan was covered by a shallow sea and there was uh, nice limey sediments or, or chalky sediments accumulating on top of it. And it apparently, when the impact occurred, it basically blasted pieces of rock loose and these things sailed through the atmosphere to land off of Florida. And then the other thing is that we also have a nice iridium anomaly. This is one of the cores that we drilled, a different one than I showed uh, before. And this is the abundance of iridium, okay, this, this sort of meteoric uh, signature uh, metal. And it increases uh, right into an, an interval right above this so-called tectite layer in here. So if this is the material that was blasted out of the crater this sort of grayish stuff up on top is probably the fine grain material, primarily from the meteor itself or the asteroid or whatever it was that hit the planet, that settled out 
of the atmosphere over probably, um, say, months to years or so after this big impact event. All right. Now, the other key thing is the age of this particular feature. We've shown that this particular event is probably associated with this big impact event in the Gulf of Mexico. And now the question is, what are the fossils here versus there? What are they like? Does this actually date to the mass extinction in the oceans? And here's what you see. These are scanning electron micrographs. They're both taken at the same uh, size scale here. And these show a very typical assemblage of latest Cretaceous microfossils from the deep ocean right below that ejecta bed, okay? And these are very typical of the time of the dinosaurs, but in the oceans. And in contrast, right above that ejecta bed, we have these very small guys up here, okay? These are the, the Volkswagen beetles, basically, compared to the, the monster truck down there. Uh, and in fact, these represent only a relatively small number of species, about three or four species, that apparently were survivors of this mass extinction. So this is very good evidence then that we have A, evidence of the big impact event on the Yucatan platform, and B, that it dates to the time of the extinction of the dinosaurs. Okay. Now there's a couple of other puzzles that have come to light in sort of after the fact, after our cruise. One of, what, of which was that we, I showed you uh, various sets of, of data from this particular core but we drilled two other cores very close by, all right? All three of these different uh, sets of samples were drilled within a space of about the size of this room, all right? And yet we came up with very different apparent records of this particular impact debris layer. In some cases, it was almost twice as thick as it was in that core, uh, and it was kind of confusing as to why there was so much variation in the amount of debris from the impact event. The other thing that we found out is that most of the sediments from below this impact layer, okay, in the latest part of the Cretaceous, most of them showed severe disturbance. Uh, typically, when you drill into deep sea sediments, all the different layers are flat lying. And yet, here we have a core from just a little bit below that, uh, that tectite green sandy layer, and here's one of these, these should be flat lying horizons that kind of migrates up like that, all right? That implies that originally flat-lying sediments have been disturbed, okay, have been rotated or overturned even um, by some kind of process. And then the other thing that we found out is if we look at, this is a reconstruction, okay, essentially of what Blake knows, the place we were drilling on, uh, looks like if you were to take away the water. This is 1,000 meters below the sea uh, surface. This is 3,000 meters below the sea surface, about 8,000 feet, okay, pretty far down. And this is that site I was just showing you. We drilled right here on the end of Blake Nose and came up with all these beautiful records of this uh, impact material. But if we take kind of a, a, uh, an ultrasound, essentially, of the structure of the Blake Nose uh, using uh, so-called seismic stratigraphy, then this is what we see. Here's the sea floor, okay, like that. These are two of the sites that we drilled on our cruise. And this is the, essentially the, the time it takes for sound to bounce off of various layers in the subsurface, okay, below the sea floor. And by using these, the sort of the, the time for sound to bounce around in here, we can reconstruct the nature of the sub, uh, sort of uh, below sea floor geology. And so what we have is that this contact between the purple stuff and the yellow stuff, this is the Cretaceous tertiary boundary right here, okay. These are late Cretaceous age sediments from the time of the dinosaurs and then sediments from after the extinction event. And notice that the layering in this late Cretaceous sediment is not flat lying anymore. This implies that there was major landsliding or, or sort of a movement of this whole sediment layer down the slope uh, associated with this big impact event. Now this is, a, this is a modern sort of image from the modern seafloor off of Norway and what you're looking at is a sonar map, essentially looking down on the sea floor. Here we have undisturbed sea floor out here, very flat lying. And then over in this case, we get essentially a big landslide deposit that has come this direction and flowed out on top of this flat lying stuff, all right? 
And I'm proposing that this is more or less what you would have seen if you looked at Blake Nose 65 million years ago after the impact event. That there would have been massive landslides like this that have kind of a hummocky surface, okay, with local highs and local lows, okay, like that, uh, caused by all this material sort of being sloughed off the upper part of the continental slope. Okay, so that's the, scenar the scenario up here, okay? Major landsliding and then the arrival of all this tektite material from the impact crater, okay, onto the seafloor on top of that. And then after that, you get the sort of slow, stately accumulation of sediment that doesn't contain all these late Cretaceous fossils that, is, that uh, formed essentially after the mass extinction. It turns out the story gets to be more interesting even still. If you go out here and look off on, uh, on a feature called the, uh, um, the, uh, Bermuda, the Bermuda Rise offshore, and there we have some old cores that were drilled back in the 1980s, 1982 actually, and uh, they look like this. So here's the bottom of the core, top of the core over there. This is the core number, uh, DSTP site 386. Um, and this is a sediment that is accumulated in an area where we ordinarily don't have a lot of chalk accumulating in the sea floor. These little uh, microscopic fossils tend to dissolve when they hit the sea floor, and so they don't actually form much of a sedimentary record. Instead, we get red clay. And the red clay comes along through here. This is all late Cretaceous age red clay. This is earliest tertiary age red clay. Okay, accumulating there. And then in between, we have this white limestone or chalk sequence that contains extremely tiny little fossils of late Cretaceous age. And the really cool thing is this, which you might not think is cool if you're not a geologist, but I'll, I'll try to convince you otherwise. Um, this is this green sandy stuff. Here's this, this red clay down here. Here's this green sandy material mixed into this kind of gray clay. And then we have the base of this white limestone sequence on top of that. And I'd submit that this green sandy stuff, these are tektites, just like the ones we observed on Blake Nose. And very interestingly, the base of this white limestone layer consists of laminated sediments, which form under relatively high energy conditions, when you have strong bottom currents flowing over the sea floor such as you might get if you had a big landslide and then strong currents carrying this material off into the abyss. And then if we look at the top of that limestone sequence, it just shows a nice gradual transition back into red clay again. And I'm su going to suggest then that what we're looking at is essentially a big impact event. That impact causes tremendous seismic shaking or, or you know, disruption essentially uh, of the, of the seafloor as far, off, uh, far away from the crater as Florida, that material sloughs off out into the Atlantic in a great big plume of sediment, all right? And then the tektites, okay, they arrive on the seafloor. They, they're flying through the air. They arrive on the seafloor off of Blake Nose, and then you get material from the early part of the tertiary accumulating after that. Out here, on the other hand, those tektites, they're relatively large particles, so when they they land in the ocean, they sink relatively quickly to the sea floor. And they actually arrive on the sea floor before this big plume of sediment carried off the shelf actually begins to settle out. So you get a kind of an inverted layer on the other hand. With, in this case, the tektites below and this material that was carried off the continental slope above. All right. Now the key thing is the distribution of this slump deposit. And this is a generalized sort of geologic column from the Western Bermuda Rise, say about 1,000, 2,000 kilometers offshore of Florida um, to the east. Here we have this red clay sequence I showed you some pictures of. There's red and black clay above that. And then here's this white chalk sequence, all right, which is of so-called Maastrichtian age, the very end of the Cretaceous. And right below this blue stuff would be this layer of tektite material that apparently was carried offshore. Now the interesting thing is that this contrast between clay above and then this chalk in here creates a very strong seismic reflector, okay, where sound waves bouncing through the sea floor bounce preferentially off of this layer of chalky material. And it forms what's called a reflector, which we can recognize all over the place. 
Now, if we look at the geologic distribution of the reflector associated with this slump deposit, this, this big landslide deposit, that's shown here in yellow, all right? So it's not found right along the edge of the continental slope because it's been eroded by younger uh, sort of current activity along the uh, continental margin here. And it's not found out here in the middle of the, of the North Atlantic, but it is found over a tremendous area, all right? And the core I showed you a picture of a little while ago, this 386, is found right here next to Bermuda. So this implies that not only did we get lots of landslide deposits uh, forming out here, okay, where we, are, where, where we were drilling uh, on the crews that I was uh, participating in, but also the distribution of this particular reflector implies that essentially the entire eastern seaboard must have failed. It must have been one heck of a big landslide carrying sediment out over essentially the entire western North Atlantic. Now I happen to like that. I'm a Californian and I've been ribbed for a long time about living in a place where it's going to fall off into the ocean because, you know, the San Andreas Fault's going to let go. Well, 65 million years ago, the eastern seaboard was not the place to be, <laughs> okay? Because it literally, apparently, did fall off into the ocean. Okay. This is fortunately a, uh, a figment of my computer's imagination, not a real thing. But in any case, let's consider now what happens when we had a big impact event back at 65 million years ago. What would have been the effects of such an event? One thing to keep in mind is that the object that hit the planet for a long time has been estimated at being around 10 kilometers across, six miles across, all right? And you can think about a 10K race, you know, running from, well, of course, it's a 7K race running from here to Falmouth, but just add a couple of extra kilometers onto it. So it takes a really good runner maybe 45 minutes to run that distance, okay? Run right through the middle of the asteroid or whatever it was. The other thing is that the oceans are on average around five kilometers deep. So a 10 kilometer object, if sort of placed by the hand of God in the ocean, would be you know, one of the bigger mountains on the planet sticking out of the ocean. Right? This is a big object compared to Earth's surface features. And there's the uh, Geoides resolution nuzzling up against the uh, KT bolide. The other thing to consider is that this thing, okay, whether it was a comet or an asteroid, was moving at an absolutely appalling velocity, okay? Way, way faster than the proverbial speeding locomotive. This thing was going at something on the order of 15 to maybe upwards of 80 kilometers a second. A bullet travels maybe a kilometer a second, thereabouts. So this is going much, much faster than that. Um, the Earth's atmosphere is maybe um, 100 miles thick, something like that. This thing would have gone through the atmosphere in about two or three seconds. Uh, and hit the planet's surface. Now the combination of tremendous speed and relatively large size adds up to an amazing amount of power uh, or sort of explosive energy. So here we have a graph that shows the asteroid diameter from little things that are the size of, uh, you know, a, well, I don't know, sort of a minivan size or a little bit uh, smaller than that, up to KT bolide type things 10 kilometers across. And this neat relationship shows over here the megatons equivalent TNT. I think it's a great set of units, all right? This is basically the explosive energy that could be released by a big impact event. And I can't really even conceive of what some of these numbers are, but just for, for sake of reference, the Hiroshima bomb was caused by, an, or the explosive energy released by the Hiroshima bomb is equivalent to something like a house hitting the planet, okay? And when you get up to something like Meteor Crater, that's getting up into the 80 to, to 90 meter uh, uh, diameter range. It releases a fairly uh, impressive amount of energy on the whole. Um, here's the world's nuclear arsenal. Okay, all the, all the nuclear weapons going off simultaneously on the planet. That releases the explosive energy of something up in the range of a kilometer or so hitting the planet. Okay, and it turns out there is a big impact structure in the Chesapeake Bay that is created by something about that size. The KT event, okay, the Cretaceous Tertiary event, is way out here with 10 to the 8 megatons of TNT, okay, vastly more, several orders of magnitude more energy than released by all the nuclear weapons, um, and considerably more energy than released by the largest earthquakes that could hit um, anywhere on the planet. 
So this is an awful lot of energy being released at once. The other thing to consider is that this may have been actually visible for quite a period of time before it hit the planet. Um, and so here we have a sort of fanciful reconstruction of the dinosaur watching the approach of, uh, of death from the skies. For example, if it was a comet of some sort, the comets might be visible for a couple of months or so before they actually, you know, happen to intersect with the orbit of the Earth. On the other hand, if it was an asteroid, one of these relatively dark, kind of coal black kinds of features, it might not, not have reflected enough light to be visible until it actually struck. Um, and then when it did hit, as I mentioned, it would penetrate the atmosphere within a couple of seconds or so. It would leave a big hole in the atmosphere. Essentially, the, the air would not be able to rush in behind this object fast enough to fill, essentially, a gaping hole blown in the atmosphere. Um, and then when it actually hit the ground, it would create a, essentially a tremendous amount of heat caused by both uh, the heating of the atmosphere and also the heating of the rocks that they actually hit. So here's the beginning of the, ex of the development of this big explosion. From space, okay, if you were sitting on the moon watching this go off, it would have been like uh, a very large hydrogen bomb exploding with some sort of, of ground level blast radiating away from the crater and then a large plume of material essentially bouncing back out into space. And it probably wouldn't expand sort of just completely out like that because of the constraining effects of the atmosphere itself. That's why you get a mushroom cloud uh, in a nuclear explosion. Now, Peter Schultz at Brown University has done some interesting models of the effects of big impact events. Uh, he likes to play around with a, a special gun that NASA has that shoots little glass pellets at targets at very high velocities. And so what you're observing here are his high-frequency high uh, video photographs of an impact at this point. Okay, there's that same impact point. This is a sequence of still images then of the development of the, of the vapor plume produced by the impact. The impact of this little glass pellet, it comes in like this at a fairly low angle and hits bang right there. And then you get this explosion that develops from that. The explosion rapidly expands downrange, okay? And then you also get material that, that essentially expands, or, or a vapor plume that expands vertically as well. The key point is that, that uh, Peter Schultz suggests that the impact was caused by an object that sailed in at a relatively low angle over, North, over South America and hit the Yucatan Peninsula, so that North America was essentially downrange of this particular impact event. And that means that this hot vapor plume Okay, produced by sort of supersonic winds and, and extremely hot temperatures produced by the impact would essentially have fried all of North America within the span of maybe 20 minutes or so. Not a nice place to be. Um, in, the on the, in the advancing part of this vapor plume, there would have been these extremely high winds, sort of super hurricane force winds that would have essentially knocked down the vegetation, knocked down all the trees in their path and picked up dinosaurs and dirt and logs and all sorts of stuff and just carried those in a great curtain across the whole central part of North America. Oh, well, it's okay. I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, the other thing that would happen is that there would have been a lot of material, bigger chunks of stuff, that would have been heaved out of the crater and those things would relatively quickly begin to return home to roost and cause secondary explosions in the vicinity of the crater. And then particularly nasty would have been all these tektites, okay, that would have been blown out of the crater and essentially lofted into ballistic trajectories, okay, into, into, into orbit, more or less. And this stuff would then have begun to return to the, to the surface of the planet very far, thousands of kilometers from the site of impact. Now, when each of those little, little particles, which might only be a couple of millimeters across or so, when they begin to re-enter the atmosphere, each one of them begins to burn up, okay, just like a little grain of dust that you see as a meteor in the night sky. And when there's trillions of these things coming back in at once, it's been calculated it would be like holding your hand under a broiler, all right? There would be so much heat produced by these little tektites that essentially it would have caused things to be incinerated on the surface of the planet 
under this cloud of returning tektites. And so here we have our poor hadrosaur here, which is very soon to become a barbecue as a consequence of the returning tektites. All right, now the effect of all of that, of this returning tektites and of the initial blast, would have been to cause very widespread wildfires on the surface of the planet. And uh, inter introducing a lot of soot and so forth into relatively low atmospheric levels. And the long, longer term effect of that would have been tremendous cooling of the surface of the planet. And there have been various attempts to use global computer simulations to model the effects of introducing a lot of dust and soot into the atmosphere. Here's the results of one of those uh, after Pete Covey's work. And uh, this shows the, the positions of the continents as of Cretaceous tertiary time. And here, extreme cooling, okay, very low temperatures uh, compared to, to normal ambient temperatures for the centers of the major mid and low latitude continents. And very interestingly, the high latitudes actually warm up for a time because they're insulated by all this dust in the atmosphere. But they also, after another month or so, they return to their ordinarily relatively frigid conditions. So this is a good, a, a particularly potent killing mechanism, okay? Not a nice place to be if you're a big dinosaur and you have no place to hide from these unusually cold conditions. So here we have uh, the scenario, anyway, of uh, this triceratops here with its ribs showing, trying to find something to eat in the frozen wasteland of North America. <laughs> this is a friend of mine, uh, not the caterpillar, but uh, the, the fellow, okay. Um, this is Michael Wilson, who's an entomologist from the University of Arizona. And he has perched on his nose a uh, caterpillar of a Citheronia splendens moth. It's a big moth that has wingspan, something like that. And I use this picture as an illustration of one of the ways you might have actually been able to survive such a cataclysmic event as this big mass extinction. And that is that the Citheronia splendens here, this, this caterpillar, it lives on the native cotton plants back here and it feeds on those things, grows to this sort of hot dog size, and then it crawls down the stems and it buries itself in the soil. And it waits for about a year before it metamorphoses and emerges as the nice moth. And you can imagine if a critter like this was sitting buried down in the soil when the impact occurred, um, it would, you know, for it, there basically wouldn't be any big change. It would emerge back on the surface of the planet after most of the dust had cleared out of the atmosphere, after new green plants had begun to regrow from seeds and from root crops and things like that, and, uh, and so it could go up on its merry way. It essentially would have slept right through the extinction event. And it may be that that was a means of survival for many groups of organisms, uh, particularly those, for example, in the deep ocean, which are used to, to surviving times of relatively low food supply, or organisms that are able to hibernate or estivate underground in burrows, such as our very distant ancestors, these little sort of rat-like critters that ultimately became us. Um, that's just a, a fairy tale, I should tell you, okay? This is one of the major problems concerning this nature of this extinction is why did some groups of organisms, organisms survive and others did not? And uh, so maybe some of you will figure that out, the younger set anyway, uh, at some point and come up with some better scenarios than what I just said. The last thing I want to say before I shut up is a little bit about the frequency of these events in the past and the likelihood of them occurring in the future. Uh, back when, uh, when, um, when Halley's Comet appeared in the skies in 1910, many people had very sort of disastrous scenarios okay, in mind of uh, all sorts of death and destruction caused by the passage of Halley's Comet. But these things actually do happen in geologic time. There, are, there have been other impacts aside from that at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. This is, I mentioned earlier on, the Chesapeake Bay Crater, which was formed about 35 million years ago. That is around uh, 20 million years or so after this big mass extinction at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. And here's this big crater, okay, which happens to sit right in the mouth okay, of the Chesapeake Bay, uh, kind of perched on top of Washington almost. 
Nice big crater formed by an object about a kilometer across hitting the planet. Uh, and then there are smaller things that hit more frequently than that. Um, this poor lady in, uh, in New York had her car bashed in by one. And then these two kids, uh, Brian Kinsey and his, his, uh, and his friend here, were standing on a street corner in Illinois, and they heard a whistle and a thump, all right? And they went over here, and they found in a little shallow hole, they found this rock sitting there, which turned out to be a meteorite. Um, as far as I know, there have been no recent recorded deaths by impact, all right? There have been some, there was a record of a guy, uh, a kid actually, in Uganda who got hit on the head by a meteorite. Uh, he was fortunately standing in a banana plantation and the banana leaves sort of cushioned the impact so he wasn't hurt at all. Uh, but these things do happen with fairly good uh, regularity. And what I just want to, to sort of close with is that we need to sort of keep in mind that the Earth is, uh, that space is full of these little rocks. And most of them are tiny little particles that are the size of dust grains. We see them in the night sky as nice little bright meteors going across the sky. But there are bigger things out there, too. And uh, with, as far as we know, there's nothing as big as the Cretaceous tertiary boundary object that's sitting out there waiting to hit the planet. But you never know. So I'll leave it at that and uh, take any questions you might have. Anybody? Yeah. How big an object would uh, you have to have in order for it to burn up before it hits the Earth? It turns out it's something on the range of around 30 meters across, 100 feet across, something like that. So most, even relatively big things, typically just burn up or explode in the upper atmosphere someplace. Um, and so it takes either a very dense object, like a big piece of iron, meteoric iron, or something that's really quite large to actually make, a, to actually make it to the planet's surface. Um, that object I showed that the kids picked up, okay, in Illinois, was probably a much bigger object when it entered the atmosphere. And they found basically a little splinter of it. But the rest of that particular meteorite was never found. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, that, the, one would anticipate very, tidal, very large tidal waves associated with the impact. And uh, the steam is actually a very interesting thing because water vapor is a very potent greenhouse gas. Um, and so if you get a lot of, of, of basically water vapor introduced into the atmosphere, of course a lot of it would rain out fairly quickly, but it could also essentially further insulate the surface of the planet. Um, in terms of the tidal waves, there is pretty good evidence for major tidal waves around the Gulf of Mexico. Pardon me. Um, and, uh, and we find, for example, in coastal, or actually fairly far inland in Texas, um, uh, near College Station um, and Austin, places like that, there are big rubble beds that consist of big blocks of rock, uh, pieces of, of trees and other things, all mixed into a layer about that thick or so, between Cretaceous sediment below and Paleocene sediment above, or tertiary sediment above. Uh, and there is also evidence on the island of Haiti uh, for uh, essentially what must have been an enormous wave that had swept right over the top of, it wasn't an island at that point, but a, a, a sort of a, a relatively shallow feature on the sea floor. It looks like there must have been an enormous wave that just went right over the top of that and carried a lot of material from the Yucatan Peninsula out into the central part of the Gulf of Mexico, or into the central part of the Caribbean. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that the big landslide, which I just described from the, the uh, eastern seaboard, um, most big tsunamis are created actually by some kind of, of earthquake uh, or, or removal, essentially a change in the height of the sea caused by a big submarine landslide. And so there must have been a whopping big tsunami produced by that, the landslide associated with the failure of the eastern seaboard. Yeah, 
there's not much good evidence from the Pacific side. Uh, I just recently saw a report uh, of possible landslide deposits from um, uh, northern Baja, California. But most of the, of the Pacific margin of North and South America has been essentially removed by tectonic processes. All the sea floor has been pushed underneath the edge of the continent. And so there isn't any record anymore. Uh, however, it might still be, if there's big enough landslides, you might find them out, you know, in the existing sea floor farther offshore. Because uh, these would have been presumably very large uh, failures of the continental margin. Um, the Florida at the time was a shallow um, sea-covered platform, like the modern uh, Bahamas, pretty much. And so, in terms of height, there wasn't really anything to keep uh, waves from going over the top of that, but uh, tsunamis build up to great height because of the frictional forces involved. And so a big wave would probably just crash or, or collapse on top of Florida and not really carry over the top of even a shallow sea wave very far. Uh, so probably not, be my guess. But there might still have been a lot of mud and debris and so forth from the Gulf of Mexico carried out into the, into the Atlantic anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like to think that if um, the impact hadn't occurred, that the dinosaurs would still be with us, and we'd all be gnashing our teeth and waving our scaled tails at each other, or something like that, okay? That uh, basically the dinosaurs were a very successful group of organisms, and there has been, some vertebrate paleontologists have claimed, anyway, that they were kind of on the way out, and that the impact was sort of the final straw for them. But they had also had kind of ups and downs throughout their evolutionary history. So I think it's not totally inconceivable that they might have actually survived and, and still be on the surface of the planet today. Um, some people would also say, well, you know, it's gotten colder over the last 65 million years. We've now had a big glacial stage and so forth. But the dinosaurs lived in Antarctica. They lived in the high Arctic during the late Cretaceous. That was a warmer time to be sure but they were able to handle the seasonality associated with those high latitude regions. So I'm not too convinced that they would have died out, sort of gone peacefully. Say again? Humans wouldn't be here if the dinosaurs were here. I don't think we could compete with sauropods tromping in our gardens and uh, T. rexes trying to eat us, you know, as we go down the street. Um, so I think that basically if you look at the evolutionary history of the mammals, Okay, our group, we evolved at the same time as the dinosaurs 250 million years ago, actually more than that. 